Today I want to talk about finding God's will. Finding God's will. What a heavy subject. Finding God's will. What is his will for Bethel? What is his will for your life? What is his will for your family? What does God want me to do with my life? What is God's will? And if you were ever in a Christian bookstore, well, if you can find a bookstore now, but if you were ever in a Christian bookstore, there are, there are hundreds and thousands of books written on this very subject. And the Holy Spirit highlighted this to me for this morning for our church and for you. So we're going to go ahead and jump in this, finding God's will. And I'm going to use the backdrop of this in casting lots. Casting lots. Rolling dice. Taking a chance. And I want to look at this idea of casting lots in Scripture. In, in modern vernacular, it could be like dice. It could be like Rochambeau, rock, paper, scissors. It could be... I, I don't, some of you are going to be, oh, that's a cult. Magic eight ball. Yeah. Oh, I am supposed to date her. I'm just, there's so many people trying to figure out what is the way for my life. And I want to look at this whole idea of casting lots and finding out God's will. We see it, we're going to look at it. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. So go ahead and follow along with me in your outline. Number one, casting lots has a biblical precedence, has a biblical precedence. You're like, really? Yeah, as you look at the Old Covenant, there are many references to casting lots. Let me give you just a few. In Leviticus chapter 16, it says that the priest was to cast sacred lots to determine which goat would be, would be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which one would carry the sins of the people to the wilderness. This is what we call the scapegoat. And what would happen is Israel would bring in two goats, or the priest would bring in two goats. He would lay his hands on the one and put all of Israel's sin on it. And one would be killed and the other one would be released. And so there was one that was going to die, one that was going to live, and the way they figured out which one was which was what? A roll of the dice. They casted lots to find out which one God approved. In Numbers 27, 21, it says, and this is God speaking to Joshua. He says, when direction from the Lord is needed, Joshua will stand before Eleazar, the priest, and will use the Urim, one of the sacred lots cast before the Lord, to determine his will. This is how Joshua and the rest of the community of Israel will determine everything. Everybody say everything. This is how they're going to determine everything they should do with a roll of the dice. This is amazing. This is in your Bible. In Joshua 18.6, it says, When you record the seven divisions of the land and bring them to me, I will cast sacred lots in the presence of the Lord our God to assign land to each tribe. So all the land that was assigned to each tribe was done by a roll of the dice, casting lots. And then, of course, many of you know the story of Jonah. And Jonah was called by the Lord to go and preach to the Ninevites. And he said, I'm not having any of that because I hate those people. And so he hopped on a boat and went in the wrong direction. And a big storm came up because when you don't do things God's way, it doesn't usually go well for you. And there's a big storm. Well, they cast lots. They drew lots to find out who would tick God off. And of course, Jonah got the short end of the stick. And what did they do? They pitched him over the side to save their own lives. Again, casting lots. We see this precedent in Scripture. Some of you are standing there. Where are you going with this, Pastor? Are you going to pass out dice to everyone today? Well, I want to talk to you about finding God's will and how it's changed. But I want to look at the new covenant now. And again, because you can sit back and say, oh, that's just an old covenant thing. 
We see another precedent for this in the new covenant. Look with me. In Acts 1, 23 through 26, it says they nominated two men. Now they're trying to fill the position of Judas, who had just killed himself and committed suicide after betraying the Christ. So they're going to fulfill that position of apostleship. And listen how they came to that conclusion. So they nominated two men. Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias, or Matthias, however you want to say it. Then they all prayed, O oh Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men that you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry. For he has deserted us, and he has gone where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11, a roll of the dice. That's in your New Testament. And so some of you are like, wow, maybe I've been missing it. God's will for my life is a roll of the dice. I want to look at this a little bit closer. Number two in your notes, casting lots is not biblically prohibited. It's, it doesn't say anywhere not to cast lots to know God's will. You can't find it anywhere. There is no command against it. Proverbs 16.33 says this even, We may throw the dice or cast lots, but the Lord determines how they fall. Wow. So, in other words, should I go to McDonald's or should I go to Burger King? <laughs> Yahtzee! Woo! Burger King it is! Should I buy this shirt that's on sale or should I buy this shirt that's way more money but man makes me look good? Yahtzee! He said to buy the better shirt because he's so good to me. Should I buy this house that we can afford over here or this big house, my dream house. God wants me to have my dreams. <laughs> Yahtzee says the big house is for me. Do you see a problem here? Yeah. Now, as I read to you, we may throw the dice, cast the lots, but the Lord determines how they fall. I need to stop here in this moment and let you know that I'm not talking about gambling. Some of you are like, ah, come see, scripture, me and my honey, we get a ride out to Tatchy with my, uh, <laughs> with my paycheck. <laughs> That's not what he's saying here. In fact, I just want you to know as you do read the scripture in regards to gambling, the Bible doesn't directly address gambling. It says, thou shalt not gamble. But there are many verses that provide all kinds of discussion and the heart behind it. And I, I don't know if I put that in your notes. I think I did. But the Bible does talk about money, materialism, attitudes, work ethic that all subtly punch gambling right in the throat. Proverbs 13, 11, 1 Timothy 6, 10, Hebrews 13, 5, 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, Matthew 6, 24, Ecclesiastes 5, 10. I could go on and on because Jesus talks more about money than anything else. And so we are to be good stewards of our money. So I'm not talking about, oh, baby, let's go to Vegas because the craps are hot. <laughs> There's a reason why those casinos are so huge. Because you're paying for them. Yeah. Moving on. What? Man, I just got this testimony that just came into me right now. I feel I have to share it for someone here. And I'm, again, one of my best friends in Spokane, Washington that I grew up with, his uncle, great guy, he, one of those guys who you meet and he's like, hey, how are you guys doing? Wanted to be one of the guy, younger guys hanging out with us, but... His uncle, my friend's uncle, and he was working for the uh, railroad and he uh, got put on permanent disability. So he was receiving a check for $2,000 every single month for the rest of his life. And back in the early 90s or late 80s, that was decent money, not great money, but decent money, 2000 for the rest of his life. 
and he decided that he was going to board one of the shuttles that took them out to one of the Indian reservations and do a little bit of gambling. And before you know it, he got addicted to gambling. And my friend's uncle lost his house, his wife, his family, his cars, everything that he owned was living at that time with his 85-year-old mom in her house waiting for his check to arrive so he could ride the shuttle back out there. And I just want to tell you when it comes to gambling, when it comes to some of these gray areas in our life, the Bible says that you can know by their fruit, their fruit. So I'm just telling you that to be careful. That was a Holy Spirit extra for somebody in here. Be careful. Number three, we're moving quickly through this. Casting lots is no longer God's preference. It doesn't prohibit it in scripture, but it's not his preference. And I'm going to show you why. Ephesians 5, 10, and 15 through 17 in your notes is carefully determine what pleases the Lord. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand. Circle that word, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. The scripture very clearly says, my sheep will know my voice. And so God wants you to carefully determine and he wants you to understand what he is doing. He wants you to know his will for your life. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. Some of you are sitting here today, you're saying, should I marry him or her? Should I quit my job? Should I buy that car? What does God want to do in and through my life? What is God's will for me? What is God's will for my family? Do you realize that this scripture I just quoted you says God has a distinct plan for your life? And he wants you to know it. He wants you to understand it. He wants you to discern it. He's not hiding it from you. But there's something that God is doing in his revealing of the will that is stirring something up in you. So casting lots is no longer God's preference. What is his preference? Well, in your notes, I want you to write in there pages, pages. These are all going to be P words because I like alliteration like I always tell you. But I'm talking about scripture. I'm talking about the Bible. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Your word. And so many people have taken this verse to say, well, it must be in the words. And so it is in the words. And so you are the person who goes and dusts off the big black Bible on the shelf. And you go, Phew. Bam! Oh, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> Bam! Don't kill that. What? That doesn't make sense. <laughs> Bam! And you're like, this is supposed to be some kind of magic book. And we treat the Bible like a, like a rabbit's foot. <laughs> And that's not what this is saying at all. In Romans 12, 2, it says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, everybody say then. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. God has a good plan, a good will. In finding his will, it is amazing. It is perfect. It is pleasing. But he says, I got to change the way you think. Because what you think you need and want, and what I think you need and want, may be entirely two different things. In fact, most of the time it is. And so I need to get into scripture so that I can find the God of the scripture so that I can know his heart. Because as I get into scripture, there's something that happens in me where my mind is being renewed and I become more like him that I'm reading about. It says it like this in Ephesians 5, 26. Christ loved the church and he gave his life for her to make her holy and clean, 
washed by the cleansing of God's word. There is a washing that takes place. There is a renewal of the mind that takes place as you get into his word. And the scripture says, as your mind is renewed, then you have the capacity to know his will. The fact of the matter is, if you're sitting out there today, I wonder what God's will is. All you're doing is telling me, I don't read my Bible. (laughs) Pastor, I don't know what God's will is. You don't read your Bible. (laughs) Casting lots requires no renewal of your mind, which is a purpose and and the heart of God in today. He wants to conform you. He's creating you. He's molding you. He's making you into someone who looks just like him. And he wants, in fact, scripture says, I have given you the mind of Christ. He has given you the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about this in a minute. Is in you. And he makes those, those words on those pages come alive so that you can know the heart of your king. And out of knowing the heart of your king, you can start to discern, wait a minute, that is not what the king wants for my life. That is not what Abba Daddy wants for my life because I've been filling and spending my life in the pages. I've been renewed so I know that my father's heartbeat isn't for that. It's for this. I got to be in the pages. Secondly, I got to be in prayer. Go ahead and write that in. Prayer. James 1.5 says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you and he will not rebuke you for asking. Oh, I don't know what to do, pastor. I don't know what to do. Let me tell you, I'm going to answer all your questions right now. Ask him. Because the scripture says, if you need wisdom, all you have to do is ask and he will give it. Oh, but pastor, I don't know what to do. Yeah, I do. You need to be in prayer a lot more. Sometimes it's a slow process. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's going to be quick, dink, dink, dink all the time. But as you press in, God's heart will be revealed. His wisdom will be revealed to you. Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. I can pray about anything. Mm, That's good. I get to have a conversation with God. And prayer is like this. Prayer isn't just a monologue where I, where he's Santa and I bring him my Christmas list. Prayer is a dialogue where I talk to him and then as much time as I spend telling him I need my rent paid, I need this, I need that, I need all these things, then I get to listen for his response. And he actually has strategies for all of these things that we find in the prayer closet. And so that is why Jesus said, my prayer is that my house would be a house of prayer. prayer. That we would have this communication, that I would know the Father's heart. That I would know his strategies for this season. I got to be a person of prayer. Casting lots requires no effort on the person to seek the heart of God. It's just like, Yahtzee, that's it. Instead of, you know what? I'm going to get in the pages and I'm going to be reading and my mind's going to be renewed and I'm, my heart is going to be transformed and my will is going to be conformed to his will and what he desires and wants. And I'm going to know his ways. And then as I start to pray, I can have conversation with God and I begin to talk to him and I have my, my war room and I begin to pray and I begin to talk about all the things that he has put on my heart and all the things that are burdening me. And then I get to sit there and I get to hear and listen for his responses as he talks to me about what we have been dialoguing about. That is prayer. Does that sound like your prayer life? Rub-a-dub-dub, thank you for the scrub. (laughs) Some of you, that's your prayer life. And God is saying it's time to take it up a level because I got great things for you to do in this in these days so get in the pages get in prayer and the third one is I want you to write in pneuma pneuma everybody turn to the person next to you say pneuma when you're Arnold Schwarzenegger accent pneuma 
The word pneumatology comes from two Greek words, which mean wind, air, spirit, and word. And they combine to mean the study of Holy Spirit. When you are, you know pneumatics, air, you know, some of you have, uh, who watch NASCAR and stuff, you'll see that they use pneumatic uh, uh, lug, what do you, lug wrenches, <laughs> like that. It's all pneumatic, driven by the power of the wind. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about here, Holy Spirit. And if you want to know God's will, you got to be in tune with Holy Spirit. Romans 8.14 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you. He wants to guide you. But when I read the scripture, I realize I got to become like a child. Then you become a child of God. And there are many people out there who say, I already know all this. I got it all together. I'm marching my own race. I'm doing my own thing. That's not a child. That's being, well... The point is this, you can have personal relationship with Holy Spirit. And he wants to lead you and guide you. 2 Corinthians 13, 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and have communion with the Holy Spirit. That communion be with you all. Philippians 2, 1 says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit. Wait a minute. There's two words represented here, two key words, communion and fellowship, and they're both directly tied to Holy Spirit himself. Paul is telling us that we can have communion with Holy Spirit. In fact, we are to desire that, and we are to have fellowship with Holy Spirit. Now, if we are going to have fellowship together, that means we're going to have to hang out together. That means we're going to communicate together. That means I'm going to love your presence. I'm going to want to be with you. I want to have fellowship with you. All throughout the New Testament, you can see the apostles and the disciples saying things like this. It seemed good to us and Holy Spirit. So we moved on. Or I wanted to go here, but the Holy Spirit said, meh. Not yet. I wonder if we see that same kind of leading of the Holy Spirit in our lives. If you put those two words together, communion and fellowship, they spell this, personal relationship. Personal relationship. A lot of people say, I have relationship with the Son, Jesus, and that's great. A lot of people say, I have a relationship with the Father. May you know the Father's love. But do you have a relationship with Holy Spirit? Pastor, are you preaching about three gods? No, I'm talking about three in one. And Paul himself is saying you need fellowship and communion with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not some junior member of the Trinity for the weird people. <laughs> To all who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. Casting lots requires no intimacy with God. And this is what it comes down to. This is the crux of this message. That if we were to become people who just roll dice or cast lots, what we miss out is what's most important. And what's most important is relationship with God. He wants relationship. He is more interested in you having relationship with him by seeking him and having intimacy with him than giving you information. And so there are many people out there who are like, God, what is your will for my life? And you're not willing to even spend any time with him. And you're like, where are you? And he's not hiding from you. He's hiding for you. And he's saying, come, seek me. Seek me. And together, we're going to walk into your destiny. Together, we're going to step into the adventure that I have for your life. Together. Because the scripture says, apart from me, you can do nothing. 
And what I have for you to do in this hour, Bethel, what I have for the church to do in this hour is greater than what you can do in your own strength. You are going to need my empowerment. So you're asking for something for me to tell you what's coming. But I'm telling you, I cannot release that into your life unless you're willing to come and embrace me. God, what is your will for my life? He's like, that's not my way anymore. I want you to know my heart. I want you to know my mind. I want you to know. I want you to be able to call me Abba, Daddy. That I am your parent. That I am your daddy. That I am your friend. That we can have a relationship. And we're going to walk this out together. So you may be sitting here, Pastor, uh, I don't know what God's will is for my life. Well, the good news is you can. Because he wants you to know it. But more than him having something for you to do, he wants you to come to him. That is the whole goal, is that you would have relationship with him. So if you're sitting there, oh God, what do I do now? Seek him. Matthew 6.33 says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added unto you. Oh, but God, I'm seeking the answer to this problem. The answer to the problem is Jesus. Yeah. Yes. No, but pastor, come on. The, I, I got rent. I got $1,200 I need by tomorrow. I'm, I got, I'm seeking the money. That's your problem. Seek first the kingdom yeah. and his righteousness and everything else will be added. The will of God is hidden I want you to picture the plan of God is sitting in his hand, waiting to be released to you. And all you have to do is come to him and stay with him and walk with him. And you're going to walk yourself right into the best life. The best life. In John 15, 15, Jesus is saying, he's like, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. A master just says, hey, Starbucks. And they go and do it, bring it back. All right, now I want a donut, go. But Jesus says, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I've told you everything the father told me. So a slave, he's saying, the master doesn't confide in, but he's saying a friend, the master, they're no longer, ma- he's a friend. I confide in you. The reality of what God is asking of our church, of you, of, this, of, the, of your family, is that you develop intimacy with God and you become the friend of God. That you would know his heart. That you would know how his heart beats. Then, then you are ready to know the will of God for your life. So, what got me on this is in a few moments here, we're going to switch to the annual meeting. In the annual meeting, we are actually going to... We are going to cast lots to find out who the next board member is. And you're like, you just preach this, Pastor. Or, what are we doing here? Let me tell you, there's no prohibition against this at all. And we just talked about you knowing God's will for your life is about intimacy with him. But I want to point you to one last scripture here. In Proverbs 18.18, 18, it says, flipping a coin can end arguments. It settles disputes between powerful opponents. Proverbs, the book of wisdom. Now, let me tell you the heartbeat of why we now draw lots or draw names out of a hat. We pray over them. I'm telling you, we still got to steward all of this process and prayer and every name that goes into that hat has been prayed over, has been scrutinized as someone who is upstanding and qualified for uh, being a board member here in this church. But through the years, my dad and I 
saw that when people put their name up for the board and the church used to vote on them, it was like a popularity contest. And so someone would say, I'm voting for that guy. And then the person who didn't get in, their, their feelings would be hurt. And they may linger around for a while, but before long, they ended up leaving the church because they're like, nobody wanted me. And even though that can be a lie and that can be the enemy speaking rejection, we realize that there's got to be a better way. And so coming to Proverbs 18.18, 18, it says flipping a coin can end arguments. It settles a dispute against powerful opponents. Having the Acts 126 precedent where they, uh, through lots, brought Matthias into the apostleship, we realize that, you know what, when you do God's way, you get God's results. Yeah. And this way we can put qualified people in the hat and we can pray together, say, God, your will be done. But it's not a popularity contest. It's got, we're going to pull out a couple names, and that's the one we believe that God has highlighted for this hour. It doesn't mean for those of you whose names go in the hat and you don't get picked, that God isn't for you. He is just as much for you. And your time and serving and, and ministering in Bethel is still here. But God is the one who positions his people into place. And so the last thing we want to see is people hurt and people, uh, you know, turned away. Before I end this meeting and turn it to my dad so we can quickly jump into the annual meeting and then uh, we're going to feed you all, I want everyone, you can stay seated, I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I know, because there's so many people here today, that there are many of you who may be struggling with finding God's will. You may be sitting back there like, I don't know what to do where he's leading what he's doing in this season. And I need to, man, I, I, I'm desperate here. I don't want anyone leaving this message today or this service today feeling condemnation like oh the pastor says I don't read enough that's true pastor says I don't pray enough that's true the pastor says I don't know Holy Spirit enough and that's true I want you to leave hearing the heart that God is inviting you into deeper fellowship and relationship and the fact that you think that you don't know God's will and maybe you don't is an invitation to know his heart to press in to journey towards him, to hear what he's speaking to you in this now moment. So I want everyone in here with your heads bowed and eyes closed to put your hand on your heart. And I want you to say, Father God, I am yours and you are mine. And I want your heart, your plan, for my life because it's the best forgive me for not trusting you Holy Spirit I want to know you more so I'm going to ramp up my prayer life I'm going to press into the word I invite you Holy Spirit to guide me and lead me I want to know your heart for me. And I know you will do just that. So I say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen.